Hello, welcome to another episode of Ymir in the support role. These are actually some of the same people I just played with, specifically Killer49 and Definer. Uh, 1999, excellent players. Uh, you'll remember them from the last episode. So that's fairly nice at the very least, but this particular episode is going to focus a little bit, I'm hoping, uh, we'll focus a little bit more on more of a standard Ymir build. Yeah, we've got Ardio as a solo, so that's more possible. Chernabog and the Morrigan can use auto attacks. It really comes down to what Killer49 picks as their jungler. If it's an ability-based jungler, I'm going to go with a standard Ymir build, because I'm not expecting the Morrigan to focus on auto attacks. She can use them, but mo I've very rarely seen people build auto attack Morgan. Best at excellent. All right, yeah, that's fine. I'm going to go then finally uh, be able to show you a bit more of a, a standard, uh, quote unquote, kind of. Uh, uh, I changed the last possible second. A bit more of a standard guardian build with Ymir. So let me see what we have here. King Arthur is probably their solo. It'll it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see which mage takes the ADC role and which one goes mid because either can work in either role. If I had to take a guess, Frey is probably their ADC. All right, we're gonna go for a Gauntlet of Thebes here. We're gonna go for Sentinel's Gift. We're gonna go for this, and we're gonna go for Healing Potions here. And Blink. All right. Same thing as last time, but this time we actually have all of the people, so we'll actually be able to have a much better start as well. So that's fairly encouraging. So, alright. Yeah, she's going for the cooldowns and the abilities. As most Morgans do, and rightfully so, she's very strong either way. Auto attack Morgan is much later game though it's definitely a risk to play but it can be done one day i'll do a series on that but not right now go ahead and put that there okay And again, we're going to use that. We're going to go ahead and auto-attack regularly. I'm going to go ahead and use a health potion at this point. Remember not to accidentally take that. And then we're going to go ahead and blink right here. Alright, just applying some early pressure. So I can do this. And then we just kill him. That's exactly what I was talking about last episode. That, that is what you want to do. As most supports, honestly. There are some that really can't get away with that as well. But Ymir always wants to do that. Because Blink is just incredibly useful on him because of his freeze. It really makes a world of difference. Being able to just Blink freeze, as you probably saw from last episode, is quite the potent strategy for the opening of any fight. Now, Geb also can pull a really effective Blink strategy as well with Blink Ult. Obviously, it's not quite as quick on the uptake as the Frost Breath, because obviously Frost Breath is not an ult, for one thing. Um, but overall, it's the same principle. Not, a, not my greatest wall. That could have been a little bit better. They weren't really in a good position for it anyways. I honestly should not have even bothered trying to wall them off at that point. That was a waste. I should have absorbed that. That was He didn't need to take that damage. I'm going to go ahead and block I with that completely. All right, my, all my wall game is clearly off today. Nope. Oh, come on. Alright. Ward this. Just make sure we don't get caught by surprise. Go ahead and 
activate a health potion here. I've been taking a little bit of poke. He's still trying to poke me, which is fairly interesting. Oh, alright. You want the uh, scorpion, I assume. No, you want the void buff. Okay. That's pretty reasonable. Okay. My dude. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I just wiped out his wave clear because it was that silly little glowy ball thing. Alright, I have blink and I have freeze, but we want this first, I suspect, yeah. Since they stole our last one. There we go. I assume they're after their heartbeat at this point. Yeah. Oh, we're retreating this? Okay. That's fair. Your left tower is under attack. Be careful, middle. Do I have enough for No, not quite. Alright, I'm gonna stay up a little bit while longer then. Be careful, right? Alright. Oh, Completed. she's talking to Bestet. Oh, she is Bestet, never mind. They're going for a harpy right now, which is fine. Is in my ult. You were going for me with that? I was I was moving to uh, body block my guy. Do not expect that move. All right, he's almost out of mana. He really can't afford to stay up for much longer, honestly. Throw a board down here. All right. Good play by. Good old Geb. Oh, okay. Well, that kind of hurt you, didn't it? Nah. I guess I'll kill him by accident. All right. I wasn't sure if that would kill him, honestly, at that point, considering uh, how risky it was to let him live at that point. Turnabog got slapped really hard right beforehand, so I didn't really want to take too much of a risk there. Ultimately, I mean, what am I going to do? Cancel it ahead of time so he can roll away? No. Uh, at that point, while it's not ideal that I take that kill, there really wasn't a ton of other options. This should be safe to get because I don't think Olorin's here anymore. I almost accidentally stole it. Guy, you're supposed to finish that off so you get the golden experience. I'm just going to stand over here so that way when he pushes me back, I still am in range. There we go. It's pretty likely I'm going to have to start rotating pretty soon. I actually might rotate now. Because I need to pick up one of the... Yeah, there's get there. Bit of a late rotation, which is my fault, but that's okay. Uh, let me see. They have enough healing where I'll want Pestilence. So we're gonna grab that. We're gonna grab some regular wards. Now, keep in mind that I'm buying regular wards because I'm going to mid lane. Mid lane requires a lot of heavy warding. So I need the extra wards to help keep that visually protected. That is why I'm buying regular wards here. Sentry wards, while well, they're really nice, I can't buy two of them, so there's not enough of them for my purposes here. You completely with that. Okay. Not bad. Okay. We have a problem. Yep. Okay. I am going to need to defend this lane. Now, I can't actually kill this wave because I actually want the assist stacks. So I'm going to have to let the tower finish the wave off. I'm actually going to push these guys into the tower here so I can get my assist stacks. Sorry. 
I completely failed to call that. Well played. Honestly, good use of ult. One of the best uses of that ult I've seen. I actually remember to... That's fine. I just didn't want him hitting my boy. I have an opportunity here, I think. No. I don't have the health for this. And I need... Silver Talisman. If only... Oh, they already destroyed my words. That means I have a sentry in the upper left. Okay. That might be why the Morgan wasn't putting any over there. Let me see if they have one on our side. On the left. That's going to be a pretty important question to ask. There's that. I'm actually going to go over there. Oh, wait. Hold on. <laughs> That's too bad. I I guess never mind. <laughs> now keep in mind, she got that because she had the little hourglass over Freya's head, which meant that her ability was going to do bonus damage to her. That's what killed her, was the bonus damage, not my ult. It was a mistake, Geb. You are dead now. Good transformation, actually. Probably a little overkill, to be if I'm going to be completely honest. Oh, I don't think... This, um, I guess I'll just lure him in, then. That's fine. No. Now I just have to body block you. Ah, shoot, I don't have enough damage. Which makes sense. Okay. Body blocking initiated. No, we're good. Everyone got out, which is all I wanted. Okay. Ah, this is a bad fight. No, please leave. Please leave. I don't care about Freya right now. You have absolutely terrible accuracy. You're kidding me. I was gonna save. Oh, holy cow. I can't believe we turned that around. You there. You serious? I mean, go ahead and kill me. <laughs> That's fine. Get my guy. You can have me at that point. <laughs> sure thing. Like, you go, guy. Oh, goodness me. I can't believe that Bastet was able to turn that around on that Freya. That was way... Once again, I got chased into oblivion. Now, the Geb did kill me and didn't die in exchange, but honestly, he's so low on health at this point, and he hasn't got... Well, he's got some protections. He's got an almost complete bond of Thebes, so that's fair enough, but... Honestly, he took enough damage where, yeah, I think he just went back. Enemy missing right. Enemy missing. Okay. That's good information. Yeah, observe. Peekaboo. You timed that wrong. I'm pretty sure she doesn't have a ult either. This could be a problem. Really excellent use of ult once again, though. Let me absorb everything for this Morgan. Don't think you're getting away. Ah, there it is. <laughs> the glory of the wall. Again, that was a really quick... What was that? A two-second, three-second wall? Three-second wall. And that's all it takes sometimes. Three seconds, and he's dead. Right? Well, three seconds, he's frozen, and then he's dead. Uh, same difference. And I can delay that mini-wave for three seconds. There we go. And the enemy team has surrendered. All right. You're probably still going to see this, even though it was such a short game and they surrendered, because it still exemplifies a lot of the... No matter how you build Ymir, the core foundation of how you want to play him does not change, and I want to emphasize that. I was going for a pretty bog-standard support build there, right? I had Gauntlet of Thebes. 
I was going for Pestilence. My next item probably would have been Breastplate of Valor, right? Which is what Geb went into. Bog Standard, uh, typical support build. Again, I want to point out that usually you customize your build according to the needs of the team. For example, I built Gauntlet of Thebes here because the enemy had three magic and two physical, so I built Gauntlet of Thebes. Last episode, I built Sovereignty because they had three physical, things like that, and I built auto-attack uh, buffs for my auto-attacking allies. I didn't have auto-attacking allies here. I built the Pestilence because Olorin heals himself and others. Frey self-heals. Sukiyomi self-heals. Right? We had one person who healed himself and others, and we had two self-healers. So I knew Pestilence was going to be important, and considering that Freya can snowball very quickly, and she starts off with passive 15% magic lifesteal, I knew Pestilence was going to be something I was going to need sooner rather than later. Based on Geb's shield, I knew that I would want Breastplate of Valor. Again, so far, pretty bog-standard opening moves, right? After this, I'm not 100% sure what I would have gone with. I probably, honestly, would have gone with Witchblade for a couple of reasons. First off, Ulrin and Freya obviously were using auto-attacks, and even though there's no one else who uses a heavy amount of auto-attacks, the attack speed debuff would actually decrease the amount of energy King Arthur would have been getting throughout the match, which would have made him... Which would have made it more difficult for him to accumulate enough for his bigger ult. So Witchblade probably would have been something I picked up at that point. Which is less bog standard support build. Um, to, you know, the typical, uh, what people normally build Mystical Mail, I think. As what they standard build. And I wasn't really going to be interested in Mystical Mail in this particular scenario. A, because Geb could just shield a lot of that away. B... Olorin and Freya, who would have been the people most threatened by Mystical Mail, were going to have enough self-heal to not care about the mild damage Mystical Mail was going to be doing, so Mystical Mail really wasn't going to be a good option here. And in fact, I don't often find Mystical Mail a fantastic option a lot of the time. That's just me. But I would have probably gone into Witchblade... And I very likely would have finished with a nice Void Stone, because Ardeo and the Morgan were both going to be busting out some magic damage. I would have splashed a little bit of magic damage in there, but we had enough magic damage on the team to justify a late-game Void Stone. Now, the reason why Void Stone can be... Uh, I was going to build so late is because it's a 10% magic protection reduction. So, the later in the game, the more effective it is, the more it's decreasing. So, ultimately, I would have been fine building Voidstone last, finish up with a nice Sentinel's Embrace to help keep my allies alive, kind of just backing up the Gauntlet of Thebes there, and I would have run with that. So, yes, my initial opening was kind of standard. Gauntlet of Thebes, Pestilence, probably would have gone, like I said, into Breastplate of Valor, and then I would have redeviated according to the needs of both my team and the demands of the enemy team. Witchblade, Voidstone right? So that was my plan, <laughs> um, which is why I'm still going to upload this, because I can actually clearly explain what I was going to build and why I was going to build it, even without necessarily needing to see what a lot of the enemy was going to build, because Freya and Olorin were clearly going to go into auto attacks. So that's really obvious by their opening builds. Geb was going to go pretty standard. His next item was very likely going to be Pestilence, because Ardeo self heals. Uh, the Chernabog had the... Um, Death Scythe, I believe it's called. Death's Toll, pardon me. He had Death's Toll, so he was very likely going to be going into possibly healing himself through that. It would have been a risk if Geb didn't build Pestilence, so to be on the safe side, Geb would have assumed that it would have been healing. The Morgan can transform to anybody who heals, honestly. Uh, Bastet probably was going to build Soul Eater later on, so Geb was very likely going to go into Pestilence at some point. Very, uh, like I said, very likely his next item, and then he probably would have built Genji's Guard if he was smart. I would have been curious to see what the Geb would have built, um, to be honest. The Geb was a bit harder to predict. Pestilence, I'm pretty sure he would have built next, but outside of Pestilence, I'm not 100% sure what he would have gone with next. The King Arthur was going to go with Genji's Guard, I'm pretty sure, and then probably would have gone into Breastplate of Valor for more cooldown. Genji's Guard, I'm pretty sure, because uh, 70 Magic Protections, the MP5, the cooldown, and while those are also offered by Shogun's Kusari, not a lot of solos build auras. Let me rephrase that, not enough... Solos build auras, but either Shogun's Kusari or Genji's Guard, they would have accomplished roughly the same idea. So one of the two. Uh, like I said, he would have gone to the Breastplate of Valor next, Gladiator's Shield after that, Soul Eater after that, um, 
possibly, or Ansley, one of the two. And then clean up with that. So, even though the match didn't finish, you can definitely walk away from this episode having a good understanding of how the game was going to evolve as time went on, what I was going to build and why. You can estimate roughly what everyone was going to build here because a lot of these characters are very predictable in their builds. Tsukiyomi was going to build pure damage. He just got Transcendence. He was going to get Hyder's Lament next, and then he was going to get Sprawler's Beat Stick for the healing, for the, the anti-healing, I should say. Uh, and then probably he would have finished up with Arundite. That That's what he likely would have gone into. So... Very predictable builds across the board for a lot of these enemies, and even for a lot of the allies. Uh, Ardeo is clearly going to be going into Mystical Mail, which is a strong item on Ardeo. This was either going to be Chin's size or, much more likely, Aussie. Bastet was going to probably go into, I would say, either Arundite or Transcendence next. Maybe even Heartseeker instead. So... Yeah, that's that's why you are still seeing this episode despite the early surrender from the enemy team. It was going to wind up being a very predictable game, but it does, again, going back to the main point that I rambled off of, <laughs> and I apologize, Ymir plays the same regardless of how you build him, alright? It's very, very important that you, as a support Ymir, you build that Frost Breath for the stun, Build up that wall so that you can do those insane wall cutoffs in the jungle, which are very easy to pull off once you're experienced enough with the Emir. You'll come to recognize. And I goofed, I've goofed, i goofed several walls for the past couple of episodes. It's been a little bit of time since I played Emir. I'm a bit out of practice with him, but honestly, it's like riding a bike. Once you've gotten it wrong a couple of times, you get back into the groove. Um... But yeah, you're always going to have walls that are terrible. <laughs> and you're going to have walls like that last wall that I had that was fantastic. Uh, but either way, your second ability to increase really should be your wall. And then Glacial Strike for wave clear purposes. Because at that point, you're probably going to be potentially needing to defend against waves like in the previous episode. And then your ult. Because again, when you're playing support Ymir, the use of the ult is not the damage. Yes, I got a kill with the ult in this game. That wasn't why I used it. Uh, yes, I got the Morgan a kill with my ult in this match. Again, that d isn't why I used it. I used it to slow down the enemy. Because that is an absolutely massive area of slow. Right? And just the slow alone can be hugely impactful in team fights. Now... I'm going to extend this episode a little bit. I normally segregate this into a separate episode... But, in this particular case, I think because of how quick that match was, we're going to talk about itemization for Ymir. Now, before we get into, like, solo Ymir episodes. Now, you've seen this, you know, before, but I want to kind of explain... Actually, i got to update this slightly because this is a little bit outdated. So is this. Now... You'll notice that there's an interesting mix of defensive and offensive options here, right? And you probably already figured out that the offensive options are a little bit more towards the solo lane. But, I'm going to be really honest. I don't play Ymir solo that often, at least not deliberately. The reason why is because as tanky as he is, and as much damage as he can bring to bear in the solo lane, he's actually better pl better played like that in Clash, or an Arena, where you can actually put that damage output to a bit wider spread use. I'll talk about that when I get onto those modes. Um, I will temporarily be suspending Clash episodes until I know whether or not Slash replaces Clash. I don't know. I've been trying to find out, and either I'm not finding the information, or no one knows for sure. What I really need to do is watch somebody play the PTS and see if they, uh, they've still got the Clash in there. Or the Siege, for that matter. Anyways, uh, leaving that aside for the time being, I typically play Amir a bit more Magic Warrior-type 
in other game modes. I really do appreciate his value as a support, mostly because his Ice Wall is an absolutely phenomenal ability. And I'm going to be really honest, when I first started playing Smite many years ago, I always considered the Ice Wall to be useless. Until I made a vow to myself that I was going to get all gods to Diamond. And I started with the Guardians, because I was a support main at the time. To some extent, I still consider myself a support main, but I've been obviously had to play other roles to get other gods to Diamond. Now, it was only when I started on my journey of getting Amir to Diamond that I really fully grasped how incredibly capable the wall can be if you use it in the right situations, if you use it in the right way. And there are a bunch of different uses for the wall. But it was at that point that I really understood the true power of the Ice Wall, and how even though it doesn't do any damage or afflict any kind of crowd control, it's hands down, in my opinion, one of the best support abilities I've ever used in this game to this point. Because I can very easily, for a up to six second time period, completely separate enemies from their team thereby completely changing the nature of a team fight for six whole seconds, which doesn't sound like long, but if you've played MOBAs for any stretch of time, you'll understand that a lot can happen in six seconds. And that's very powerful. In previous episodes, I've talked about the incredible use, and the incredible real power of Kumbakarna's ultimates in being able to completely remove an enemy for, I think, four seconds, five seconds from a fight. And how incredibly powerful that can be, and how wonderfully demonstrated that, that was in Joust. The Ice Wall is the same thing, but for a slightly longer, and on a much, much shorter cooldown. Granted, it's much harder to cut off people who have a jump. But there is a second utility to that. I'm going to take Fenrir as an example. A lot of Fenrir players want to initiate with the jump. They want to jump in, get the stun, do that damage brutalize right afterwards, and thereby unload half their kit before they, you even can react. By putting up a wall, even in front of a Fenrir that hasn't jumped yet, you are forcing that Fenrir to either use Brutalize or use Leap to get over that wall and join the fight, but now he's an ability down. So he either sacrificed his Leap, thereby removing his stun, which massively hurts his ability to enter a fight and survive, or he used Brutalize, and while he'll still have the stun with Leap, he no longer has the damage of Brutalize available to him. So no matter what he does to get over that wall, he still loses, and that's powerful. So even if you're walling off an enemy that can jump over the wall in some way, they have to sacrifice something, usually their initiation, and that can really hurt their potential in a teamfight, because... If you've played enough teamfights, and boy howdy have I, you will rapidly realize that it's each individual's entrance into a teamfight that creates their most significant impact. When you first enter a teamfight, that is the biggest impact on that fight you're going to make, because you have your whole kit up, and you can use all your abilities. They're all up, theoretically speaking. And that's where you're going to do the most damage, that's where you're going to do the most disruption. So by um, just eliminating their primary form of initiation with a wall, you are removing their biggest moment in that teamfight. And that is something that often is indescribably useful. And it's indescribably useful because it's very hard to quantify how much of an impact that can really have on teamfights. If you really want fantastic examples of this, actually go back to the previous episode and watch... As I wall people off, either they can't get back into the fight because they have no jump, or they have to use their jump to get into the fight, and they're not able to aim it because they can't see diddly squat. Right? Or, in a couple of times with Fafnir in the previous episode, you may have noticed that I waited for Fafnir to jump before walling, because what I was trying to do was force him into a bad jump, force him to pick a direction, really. And Fafnir knew that, so even without me using the wall, in that particular context, the wall still had an impact. Fafnir couldn't afford to jump while I was standing there, because the instant he jumped, he was going to be cut off. So he was trying and failing to 
edge his way in such a situation that no matter where he jumped, he couldn't be walled off. But at that point, he was in the jungle, and it didn't matter. So even without me using the wall, the wall still had a really significant impact on how Fenrir played and how incapable Fenrir really was of getting away, even without me using the wall. And that's powerful. Just the threat of the wall alone can get you to accomplish things as a support, as a support Ymir, that you can't accomplish with other supports. And I think this is why, ultimately, Ymir is the free guardian. I disagree with Ymir being the first guardian available to new players, because he's surprisingly high skill ceiling. I've just been extolling the virtues of the ice wall, but at the end of the day, it takes practice to really utilize it in these ways. I can pull this off because I understand the wall. That sounded way less corny in my head, and I apologize. But I've played Ymir for a long time. I have a star with him. I've had him diamond for a while. I've played a lot of Ymir in my time. And that's how I understand how to use the ice wall so well, to put it less tacky. A new player isn't going to have that experience for the very obvious reason that they're new to the game. Um, so, while I do appreciate the incredible power of a support Ymir, I don't think he should be the first guardian that new players are introduced to. I, I don't think his skill ceiling as a character is low enough for that. I think an easier guardian should be used. That's a discussion for another time. Right now, we're really focused on Ymir as the glorious support that he is. Now, the reason why I tend to build Ymir a bit more Magic Warrior in non-conquest game modes is because it's much harder to use the Ice Wall to its full potential in other game modes. Consider, for instance, Clash. At least for the time being. Where... Unless you're fighting in one of the two jungle areas, well, technically one of the four jungle areas, a wall isn't going to do a whole lot of good. There are situations where you can wall somebody off against a naturally occurring wall in the, on the map, but these aren't as common as they are in Conquest. So it's a bit harder to use the wall effectively, and that's actually one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the Slash map is because there's a much bigger jungle, and Ymir is actually going to be way more effective in Slash than he is in Clash. Right, But you also have the exact same problem, but worse, in Arena. Ymir is terrible in Arena for this reason. There are situations where the wall is incredibly useful, and I have used Ymir to great effect in Arena, again, more because I really know Ymir than anything else. But he's my one of my least favorite supports to play in Arena, and to compensate for that, once again, I do tend to play him as a Magic Warrior. Of late, I've been running Animosity on him in these situations, because Animosity is incredibly powerful on Ymir because of his passive. But, for Conquest, the Ice Wall is one of the most potent things you'll use as a support. And if you look at the Ice Wall and you're like, oh, this does nothing, you are so wrong. It just takes practice to recognize where and when you should wall, how you should be walling, and what your end goal should be with each wall. You should know, before you wall, why you're walling. It still sounds weird, and I apologize, but as you practice with Ymir, as you understand team fights as Ymir, you will come to learn how to use the wall in a devastating way against the enemy team. And I will go out and state that Ymir is grossly underused. He is massively slept on as a support, because the Ice Wall, at least for Conquest, is hands down one of the best support abilities you have access to as a player. So, I didn't even talk about the items. I was too busy extolling the virtues of the Ice Wall. Um, when I do build a warrior-type Emir, and by warrior-type I mean a combination of attack and defense, like I said, I usually am going to go into Animosity. 3% of your maximum health is magical damage to enemies and structures. Not only is that potent, but it's a little-known fact that Ymir has the highest base health. Not by much, but he has the highest base health in the game. At least the last time I checked, maybe somebody's replaced him in this recently, but last time I checked, which was last year, he had last year or the year before, 
he had the highest baseline health, 2590. So this is actually the best single character in the game to use animosity on, besides his passive doubling the damage that his auto attacks are doing anyways, which is fantastic. Um, but when I am building animosity, I'm usually going to run, at the very least, once again, Talisman of Energy, I'm going to usually run Shogun's Kusari, I'm usually going to be running... Breastplate of Valor. Now, the reason why when I build a warrior-type Ymir, I'm building these three, Talisman of Energy and Shogun's Kusari I discussed in the previous episode, but Breastplate of Valor is very important, specifically for the cooldown reduction. Now, the reason why that's important is because the more often you can inflict Frostbite on enemies, the more damage you're doing. Now, I want to point out the fact that Frostbite has a 6-second duration, and yet Glacial Strike has an 8-second cooldown, and Frost Breath has a 16 second cooldown. That's long cooldowns. So to help with that, building Breastplate of Valor is an absolute boon. Sometimes I'll build Ethereal Staff. Not always. It's not my favorite thing to be building, in all honesty. Sometimes I'll build one of these for a little bit of attack speed. If I am going to build one of these, it's usually going to be Demonic Grip or Hastened Ring. And even then, hands down, I almost always will consider Demonic Grip whenever I'm playing with a magic-heavy team, like I have two mages on my team, Demonic Grip is really potent there, for obvious reasons. Sometimes I'll build Mystical Mail. If I'm up against somebody invisible, I will guarantee to be building Mystical Mail, right? Loki, the Morgan, etc. Mystical Mail is a requirement there, because you'll actually be able to see where they are by the damage they're taking. Absolute must. I will all... I will often also build Stone of Fall or Void Stone, or sometimes even both. Um, they're both very useful to a warrior type Ymir. Um, and that's what I'll usually run with. I don't often run with Polynomicon, and the primary reason why is because at 75% of your magic power, even when I'm playing a warrior type Ymir, I'm really not building that much magic power. So I often don't do that much more damage with Polynomicon. You'll do maybe... Oh gosh, maybe you'll do an extra 75 to 100 damage, depending on what else you're building. It's really not that big of a deal. Yes, it's every three seconds, but honestly, with Animosity running here, you're looking at three grand of HP, where I'm rounding up, honestly. Three grand of HP, 3% of three grand is 90 extra damage per auto attack, right? I mean, what's not to love? So... No, that's not 90. Yeah, it's 90. So, I mean... Animosity is hands down better anyways than Polynomicon. And Polynomicon doesn't give you any kind of defensive bonus. So, and honestly, I don't really use a whole lot of lifesteal on Ymir because the wall doesn't heal you. The wall is great for other things, but it doesn't heal you. And hitting people with your ult is, as you probably figured out, not guaranteed to be that hard hitting. So, yeah, I don't often build Polynomicon. It's there for the occasional moment where I'm feeling particularly slappy, but honestly, a lot of the times I won't build that. I'll build that pretty much only if I'm really far ahead and I just want to slap some people around really quick, discourage them, and get them to surrender a little earlier. But that's a whole different thing. So, that's, that is typically how I'll build Ymir. Uh, for warrior type. And that's the glories of Ice Wall. I hope, if the first episode didn't really inspire you to play Ymir or give Ymir a try, I hope this does, because he really is, in terms of supports, he really is one of the best. And, again, I'll reiterate, I think he's underused. I think he's underestimated, and I think his potential impact on team fights is more... His potential impact on team fights, I should say, is higher than any other support in the game. If you know how to use the wall. And with that being said, if you liked this, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, please ignore me. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, ideas, suggestions, or requests, please leave them down in the comment section below. And thank you all very much for joining me, and have a great 24 hours.